Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Brought to you by Khaki, the Center for American Culture and Ideas. And what's new and exciting in your world this week? Well, Hertz has been in the news repeatedly. First off, two years ago for failing to keep track of their cars. Hertz went so far as to file criminal charges against more than 200 customers for failing to return cars. And Hertz filed some of those complaints years after the customers had returned their cars. So the problem was simply, I mean, in some cases, maybe the customers actually did steal the cars, but in a lot of these cases, Hertz just misplaced the paperwork. Having rented cars, man, that seems exactly right. Not satisfied with its customer disservice, Hertz has recently upped its game significantly. In May, Hertz fined customer Joshua Lee $280 for failing to fill up his car's gas tank before returning it. I read about this. (laughs) The problem, Mr. Lee had returned to Tesla. (laughs) And you know, if they're charging him 280 bucks to refill a car without a gas tank, how many of the charges on all the other people were every bit as bogus? Exactly, right. And how many people just, you know, you don't even read it, you just pay it, whatever, make it go away. But... It gets worse because Hertz will not be outdone by Hertz itself. More recently, Hertz has fined one of its customers for receiving a ticket from a red light camera. The problem? The ticket was issued before the customer picked up the car. (laughs) The mix-up occurred because the customer reserved the car for 10.30 p.m., but the rental agent erroneously recorded 10.30 a.m., So consequently, the customer not only got fined for the previous renter running a red light, but also got charged for an extra day's rental. Now, these sorts of mistakes, you can see this happening. The agent puts AM instead of PM, and Hertz reviewed the evidence and agreed that the extra day's charge was an error, but they refused to remove the fine for the ticket. Hertz admitted that the car ran a red light before the customer took possession of it and yet insists that the customer pay the ticket. I don't even know what to say about that. (laughs) And for listeners who would like to read more about Hertz waging war on its customers, please check the show notes for a story on, and I am not kidding, Hertz getting so mad at a customer that it banned his descendants from renting cars. <laughs> Let me try and turn this ship around <laughs> before it really gets out of control. And we're going to talk about this a little later in the episode too, but headline from Investopedia, nearly a quarter of American Gen Xers, that's us, by the way, you and me, say they won't retire, survey shows. Yeah, yeah. A quarter. Yep. Holy hell. That matches with what I've been reading of late about how much savings Americans have at various ages, and it is astoundingly low. I'm talking about your people who are 60 to 65, the average is like $200,000 in savings? Yeah, no, functionally, and that sounds like a lot of money, but it doesn't really last as long as you think. And functionally, this means that people in their 60s are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, yeah. And that is going to cause a problem. The rule of thumb here for people who are interested, because you're absolutely right, 200000 does sound like a lot. You've got to live off the interest on that. And the rule of thumb, if you want to live off just the interest preserve the principal, you withdraw 4%. So you're talking 200000 in savings, that's the equivalent of $8,000 a year. Ouch. At 4%, you're probably going to need a million. Yeah. Maybe a little less, but not much less. Yeah. That is not a reality that our generation is going to see. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen, which means they're going to work until they die. Yeah, that might be the case. And with all of the upheaval with Social Security, it becomes really scary. Yeah, even with Social Security, a number of retirees now are not really doing all that well. Yeah. I mean, imagine suffering the inflation we just did and not seeing 
cost of living I, there were cost of living adjustments but it's it's my assertion that they didn't match the inflation yeah i don't know what the numbers are but it wouldn't surprise me i don't think they ever really match inflation the government is in the business of shortchanging people that's what government does <laughs> but of course yeah, that brings us to the foolishness of the week and for the foolishness of the week how do we have any choice but to head down to louisiana where our good friends there are mandating that the Ten Commandments be posted in every classroom from kindergarten to college. From kindergarten to college? Well, when they say every, they mean every. Wow. And given Louisiana's stellar record on education, you can see why they would waste some of their time on this. Hmm. I believe they were 47th or 48th in the 50 states. I don't know. Doesn't surprise me. And yet, this is what the legislature is thinking about in Louisiana, and the governor can't wait to sign it, the first court that sees this is going to tell them to go f*** themselves. Mm. You know, that's why you ask why on earth we're doing this. And I suspect it has something to do with the time of year during an election year. Yeah, that's right. Just guess. A bunch of grandstanding by a bunch of politicians who know that what they're about to do will be overturned the minute it gets into a court. Yep. The minute. So they know they're wasting their time, but of course they're not wasting their time if they can virtue signal in this way to their respective constituencies. Shame on all of them. And look, you and I went to a lot of high schools in our days on the road, and only in one of them did we ever find the Ten Commandments up on the wall. Do you remember? It was in that school in Texas. Oh, was it Texas? I was going to say Kentucky. Well, in Kentucky, we went to a Catholic school, so I think it's acceptable. No, I was thinking of Jackson County, actually. I don't remember seeing the Ten Commandments there, but I sure do remember seeing them in the auditorium of all places in Texas where they had us speaking. And I remember pointing to them. There were five on the left and five on the right. Oh, I I do remember this place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, I leaned into you and I said, what the hell is that all about? Yeah. And you said, well, I guess it's Texas. Yeah, right. (laughs) And I think that's right in some respects, right? You have to take into account local culture, but it is illegal. Everybody knows it's illegal as a matter of constitutional law, as things have been determined over the years. Right. You can agree or disagree with it, but the Supreme Court has said specifically this is illegal. On numerous occasions. It's not like this is a thing that got said once in 1832 and we all just went about our business. Right. So here we are right back at this nonsense again. And I just want to point out that this is a bunch of grandstanding by people seeking political office. Pure and simple. It isn't Mm -hmm. about the Ten Commandments. How do I know this? Why on earth would a bunch of Christians want the Ten Commandments in school anyway? It's from the Old Testament. Why don't they want the Beatitudes on the wall? Mm. Wouldn't that make more sense for Christians? Which version of the Ten Commandments do they want? There's more than one. Do they even know that? No, they do not. But they don't specify which version, which means I don't know what I'm supposed to put on the wall. Right, and on and on and on. And the thing that really irks me is when someone says, okay, let's put, for example, the Ten Commandments on the wall, and I'm thinking you don't realize what you're doing because you and people you agree with control government right now. But if this is allowed, what happens when people you don't agree with control government and start putting things on the school wall that you don't want? All you're doing here is giving the government additional power that's going to be used against you eventually. And you know what's going to happen next, right? The Muslims are going to say, well, what about us? The Satanists, who do this all the time, are going to say, what about us? And I like to point out to people who say, yeah, this is a great thing. There have been tens of thousands of gods that human beings have worshipped. Mm -hmm. Tens of thousands. What do you think the odds are that you got the one needle in that divine haystack that's the right one? Because all those other people are coming to the party, and they're going to be saying, ours too, please, and there won't be enough wall space left by the time you're done. And remember, when the Satanists put their shit up right next to yours, you asked for it. Or worse, there's not enough wall space, and now you put the government in the position of having to pick. And now you've got a serious problem. That's exactly the problem we have sought to avoid, mm-hmm. and we have done remarkably well with. And the people are coming out of the woodwork now. They say America is a Christian country. No, it's not. America is a secular country that happened to be founded, in a majority way of speaking, by Christians. Yeah, and I don't disagree with that. However, 
in the original, some of the states were indeed overtly Christian, that the whole question of religion was left to the states. Yes, some of the states were, but the United States is not. Hmm. It is not a nation founded on Christian principles. It's a nation founded by a bunch of Christians. There's a real difference between those things. Sure, but herein lies an interesting conversation. So Texas wants to do this. Could the people in Texas not simply say, look, we're going back to the roots of the United States when this was a state issue and it should always have been a state issue. The Supreme Court shouldn't have weighed in on it. Yeah, and then every other state gets to decide that it's not going to follow the Supreme Court's ruling on this one thing or on that one thing. All of a sudden, we have segregation in a state again because, well, we don't like Brown versus Board of Education here. You see the danger with this kind of thing. You're making the argument more broad than I had in mind, but I'm wondering, is it the case that the Supreme Court called it wrong when it came to that specific issue of the Ten Commandments in the schools? Should it have said it's a state issue? Look, that gets us into the doctrine of incorporation, which I think was a specious mm. doctrine in the first place. But what you're actually talking about here at root is nullification. And to allow a state to overrule the Supreme Court is a path to disaster. I'm with you there. No such thing as the rule of law if we do that. No such thing whatsoever. I'm just revisiting the Supreme Court's decision. And this business about, what is the word used, incorporation? That's correct. That's worthy of an entire episode. It's worthy of a course in law school. It, mm -hmm. It's long and torturous and involved, and it would take forever to get through even the basics of incorporation. But what you have is the Supreme Court applying the Bill of Rights selectively to the states, mm -hmm. which is why you can't have a crash on the green Christmas, but it's okay to have gun law. Mm, mm. Right, because it's selective incorporation. This one, but not that one. Yeah. And so just to fill in, because I'm much more aware, perhaps, than you are of what our listeners aren't understanding, because it's taken me years dealing with you to understand it. The Bill of Rights applied to the federal government initially. They were never meant to apply to the states. The first few words of the First Amendment that governs all 10 of them is Congress shall make no law. And that's it. Congress shall make no law. For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. We give a special shout-out to our Patreon sponsors who help us keep the lights on. If you'd like to contribute, go to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers. This week, Chase Oliver joins us. Chase is the 2024 Libertarian Party nominee for President of the United States, Dubbed the most influential libertarian in America by Rolling Stone, Oliver is a champion of the rights of the individual against the growing power of the state. He began his political activism opposing the war in Iraq under George Bush, aligning with the Libertarian Party after an encounter at the Atlanta Pride Festival in 2010. In 2020, he ran for Congress in Georgia's 5th District to complete the term of the late civil rights icon John Lewis. In 2022, he ran for U.S. Senate, debating incumbent Senator Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker's empty podium. Oliver was widely credited with causing the runoff election between Warnock and Walker. Chase, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was great to see you guys again after the South Carolina Libertarian Convention. I think it was the last time our paths crossed. That's right. The first time in my case that our paths crossed. It's nice to see that you've, well, I was going to say progressed as far as you have, but you've progressed as far as what is possible in the Libertarian Party. Yeah, it was a, a great time winning the nomination, and uh, it, it all kind of started in South Carolina, actually. So you guys got to see the very beginning of the whole thing. And then, uh, yeah, about 22 debates later <laughs> and many but, hours of voting on the floor, we uh, came to the conclusion that I was the nominee. Y'all got to see the beginning. Now you're seeing the beginning of the next stage. I said to James that going over your website and platform and videos in preparation for this conversation, I was impressed to the extent to which you have refined your arguments. Well, you know, that has to do with a wonderful policy team that can, you know, see the objectives and then find all of the information and the basically the supporting literature, if you will, that supports our platform and what we're fighting for. I'm super proud of what we've put out there for the American voter and urge every single voter out there to compare and contrast my platform with those of my opponents. And I think they'll see a lot of things they like from me that might maybe, you know, be lacking from the other candidates. Chase, what's been the most surprising thing so far? You said you've been refining things. So I'm sure there's been a lot of 
surprising things happening on that end. You say that we saw you at the beginning and the run towards the nomination is a grueling marathon. So I'm sure there were things there, but what were the two or three most surprising things on the way to right here? Well, you know, I think one of the surprising things is we thought that the libertarians had a lot more brand awareness than they did. Many people, when I introduce them as a libertarian, they still say, what is that? Not having the greatest grasp on what it means to be a libertarian. You know, some will say, oh, libertarians, Gary Johnson ran back in the day. That's a libertarian. Gary Johnson is a libertarian, and he certainly did run, but they don't have that brand awareness the way they do that I think a lot of other people might expect because we are the third largest political party introduce a lot of voters to our principles and to our concepts, hearing their reaction in real time, you know, having zero brand awareness. And that's certainly one of the things we have to do as libertarians is raise our brand awareness and stop people from being confused. I think the other thing is, is a lot of people had this misnomer that we're selfish people, that libertarians don't care about other people. I care about people. I just don't think the government has a job of caring for people. And so, you know, just regular conversations with people have been illuminating you know, the most surprising thing is how crazy the travel really is. Now I've been to all 50 states, and I do have to say, it is a much larger task than I originally thought, and I'm enjoying it. It's been a great adventure, but uh, at the outset in South Carolina, when I saw you guys, I didn't realize how many airline miles I was going to be adding <laughs> and how many individual one-on-one I was going to have with non-libertarians, which is now the focus of my entire campaign. I'm still speaking of the libertarians, of course, but I'm a much larger audience now to try to reach. If you don't mind, I want to jump in on your platform. A topic that's near and dear to my heart is the federal budget. You say, as many candidates do, you want to reduce federal spending. You didn't go as far as Donald Trump in saying that you're going to pay off the debt in eight years, but you do say that you want to balance the budget. And I've got to ask you a serious question. At $1.6 trillion deficit, how do you propose to pull that off? I think the numbers actually have gone up. I think they just adjusted that to $1.9 trillion this year. And it starts with the fat, like a lot. There's a lot of things government does that are redundant, where there's multiple agencies doing the same thing. That's the first area you want to look to cut, because if three people are doing the same job, just like in any business, you might want to cut the workforce down to size to be appropriate to what you're doing. But a lot of it is actually having to hit the sacred cows of entitlements, you know, the big things, Social Security, Medicare, we have to start reducing spending in those areas. Because those are the largest drivers of our debt and deficit. And then as an anti-war guy, we have to have massive Pentagon cuts, massive cuts in the spending to our military industrial complex, because the largest non-entitlement spending is our military. And it is something that for a long time, for my entire adult life, has been much larger than it needs to be. We continue to spend more and more. And really, we're not putting our priorities where they need to be in terms of our defense and our military. You can just see that by the fact that the VA is barely funded compared to the DOD. And we had over 140,000 soldiers lost to suicide since the war on terror began. So I think we maybe want to put our priorities more into mental health care for veterans and less into dropping bombs around the world. But it really involves those big sacred cows and the Pentagon, which somehow Americans have been convinced that, oh, if we don't have a trillion dollar military budget, we're going to be subject to invasion, which is, to me, kind of ridiculous. I've got to push back here because the defense budget is around $800 billion. And let's round off your number to deficit this year of $2 trillion, so you can shut down the entire Department of Defense and you still don't even come halfway, which means there's no question you're going to have to cut substantially into Social Security and or Medicare. What do you propose there? Well, as far as Social Security, the long term picture is making sure that younger would have to contribute anymore and being able to get their money back while the employer contribution remains to let older retirees, people who are currently living on a fixed income, retire. So what we have to understand is Social Security is going to be more of a long term. It's going to be cut year over year as we have more people leaving the retirement pool, no new people entering. And with regards to Medicare, a lot of this is going to have to come from looking at ways to reduce spending through targeted cuts in benefits that are going to need to happen. And here's the thing. I'm actually being brave enough to say that I'm going to touch the third rail of politics. That's something that neither of the other major candidates are even talking about because they would rather us just continue to deficit spend. Because we can talk about tax cuts all we want, but here's the thing. If you're a Republican and you pass a tax cut without a spending cut, you're now increasing the inflation. You're now increasing the amount of dollars that are printed every year to cover the losses. And cost of living increases on every single American while you're claiming you're cutting taxes. You're actually making it harder for each and every American family to get along each month. So, yeah, there's going to have to be lots and lots of cuts. 
and it's going to hurt in a lot of areas of the economy. But if we're not doing it now, the hurt is only going to increase as that deficit and debt increases and makes it harder and harder for us to get to a balanced budget. The balanced budget is the North Star. Uh, if we're not cutting immediately, we're not doing it right. Chase, I want to draw your attention to something Ant and I talked about in the opening of this episode, and that's retirement and retirement age. And I want to ask a very basic question, but first this. 25% of Gen X, my generation, Ant's generation, say that they will literally never retire. 25%. If there's something else out there that points to a certain brand of hopelessness worse than that, I don't know what it is. An entire generation of people saying that they will not be able to retire. Given everything that you would have to do with cuts and the whatnot, what do you think a reasonable retirement age even is? It's something we never really talk about. Every now and then somebody says, well, maybe we should think about increasing the retirement age. And then the entire political world convulses and we just drop it like a hot potato. But you're going to have to cut things that way too, right? People are going to have to work longer. Oh, yeah. You know, to me, it shouldn't really be Social Security. You know, eventually I would like to remove Social Security entirely and have this be a privatized thing. Government mandated retirement age when benefits would kick in. Uh, that would be your comfortable retiring. But yeah, I think more and more people are going to start retiring later. And if we have the system as it exists, there's no way to keep it solvent without raising the retirement age. So, I mean, if you're not interested in completely getting rid of Social Security, if you want to keep the system as it is, and you're not talking to the retirement age, you're not really being serious about the issue. Because now, now, now it's my turn to push back a little bit, because this system has stolen almost 13% of my income every year I've ever worked. Do I want Social Security to continue? Well, that's a loaded question, isn't it? I've already lost a small fortune to it. Yeah. So, yeah, I kind of want to get that back. Do I want the system to continue on forever? No, it's unsustainable. And somewhere in between those two observations, there's a political reality that we all have to face. Yeah, the political reality is that we're not going to see Social Security retirement. You know, I'm 40. My generation is going to have to basically fend for themselves because the system is so insolvent. For those who are already on a fixed income, that's my parents and many people's parents and grandparents, we don't want to just dump them off because <laughs> let's be real, raise your hand if you're able to just to right now take care of your parents if all of a sudden all of their medical bills were put on you, right? It's just not sustainable. And so I want this generation and the generation that's about to be to be the last generation that have to go through that. I know you've paid in a lot longer than say I have, right? You're a generation ahead of me. Your generation should be able to retire either with full or scaled back benefits as we roll this back. And that's, you know, the reality of it is as you get younger and further and further back to where you get to my age, I'm going to get taxed for Social Security and not get benefits. For people who are in Gen X generations about to be retiring, they are going to either be retiring with nearly all of their benefits or slightly scaled back because we have to reduce the program to keep the system solvent long enough. And this is, speaks to the issue of so many Gen Xers saying, well, I'm just going to have to work forever anyways, because they realize what they get really doesn't pay back what they put into it in terms of the value. And so, yeah, it is a real reality that we have to face. And it's one that I would rather us face head on with honesty than to keep kicking the can down the road until it becomes a real crisis that affects not just your generation, but also my generation and the generation behind me. That's a refreshingly honest answer. <laughs> I don't think it gets anyone elected, but it's the answer that should get people elected because eventually we're going to have to do exactly what you're saying. It's the answer that literally everybody from every party should be making. The math is inescapable. And once you've turned math into a partisan issue, losing is the only possible outcome. Yeah, math always wins. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's because I'm a part of the community that's going to not have any benefits once this thing goes completely belly up. Even though if we keep paying into it, we're going to basically be robbed of our wealth. And so money for my generation to be comfortable enough to grab that third rail and say the truths that need to be said, because the people who have been in charge of Washington, D.C. are the same people who have been in charge for the last 25 years. And they've refused to acknowledge reality. And maybe it's time we have a reality check. We're living in a fantasy world if we think we're just going to be able to live off these benefits forever and it's never going to affect us. And that just inflation and debts and deficits are just this ambiguous thing that doesn't affect us. Uh, it affects every American family when they go to the grocery store and they see inflation hitting their grocery cart. You know, maybe it takes somebody from a younger generation to not have the fear in discussing this. Let me change gears here for a second if I can. One of the points on your platform is that you are proposing to close all overseas military bases. And I'm less concerned, we've talked about the finances, I'm less concerned with that than I am about the practicalities. I, as a pacifist, can get on board with that very much. However, 
when I picture someone in the role of president and all of a sudden you have responsibilities that I as an individual pacifist don't have, it strikes me as perhaps not necessarily wise when I see things like Russia invading Ukraine or China threatening Taiwan. Think back to Iraq invading Kuwait. Is it wise for us to shut all of our overseas military bases? Well, I think it's wise for us to change our foreign policy objectives from one that's based in you know militarism to one that's more based in free voluntary exchange, free trade, diplomatic relationships. I think we can see that we've expanded our military arm. I don't think we have a, you know, a more stable world than we would have had otherwise. I think it's important for us to be able to protect our you know, nation from invasion, but I don't think it requires us to be extending our military hand everywhere around the world. It doesn't mean that there won't be bases that are maintained and run by allies of ours, friends of ours that we can utilize if we were needing to fight in a war. I would like to see a gradual decrease. If I were elected president, I wouldn't say, okay, turn them all off today. As much as I would like to as an anti-war guy, like I recognize the practicality of having to go to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and to my perspective, Secretary of Defense, and saying, all right, we need a priority list of what we're shutting down first. The first things we're going to shut down are non-priority bases that are just existing out in the world that cost us a lot of money that aren't strategic at all. And as we draw back, we're going to start seeing where we might have to maintain a presence a little while longer in order to transfer maybe our bases and our infrastructure to, say, allies in Western Europe. We have a large Air Force base in Germany, for instance, Rammstein Air Force Base. There's nothing that says that we can't transfer that over to the Germans, let them maintain that base, let them maintain that facility so that we don't have to. While I would like to get that all done in eight years, I recognize that that's a very fast timeline. But if we're not putting the ideals out there, we're not putting what we want to see in the future out there, we're not shifting the Overton window. Let me jump on that thought. I wanted to get to the bases too, but now I want to get away from them because you just said an interesting thing, Chase about getting the ideas out there. And we've long noticed, Anthony and I, that libertarian ideas do really, really well. And I can't speak to every libertarian campaign that's ever existed, but you know, there's the natural obstacles you have to overcome with fundraising and ballot access and just getting the word out. But I think one of the things libertarians need to do better about is speaking our values and speaking our messages to non-libertarians, being able to approach people who either have little or no reference for what we are. And be able to put our principles out there and not be gatekeepers either. Recognize that there will be people who have problems with one or two or parts of my platform, but can say, hey, I agree with most of the." And the last thing we need to do is be like, "Uh uh-uh, you're not pure enough to be my supporter. Don't do that. You got to like the thing that I say. Otherwise, I don't want your vote. That's not the threshold that Donald Trump has for his voters. That's not the threshold that Joe Biden has for his voters. That's not the threshold that anybody who's ever won an election has for their voters. And so I think we as a party need to be better at recognizing that there's a spectrum of libertarianism. And yes, the Libertarian Party is going to put the bold, principled libertarian message out there. But there are a lot of people who are libertarian streaks or soft libertarians or libertarians on A, but not on B. We need to earn those voters and speak to them in a way that is respectful, that isn't talking down to them. And that isn't saying, well, just because you're not a pure libertarian all the time, you should just go vote for Trump or Biden. Well, that's a pretty reductive way of trying to run a political campaign. And so I'm somebody who says, hey, you might not agree with 100 percent of my platform, but I think what my platform is, is is based in reality. It's based in logic. And we can argue the pros and cons of each one of those things. But by and large, I think I have the best platform for the American people, one that can shift our discussion towards liberty and away from authoritarianism. I think the biggest hassle we have to be is I hate to use this term, talking to normies, quote unquote. We have to be better at talking to non-libertarians. And along those lines, you're very much in the hot seat here because the latest poll I saw, James quoted this a couple of weeks ago, 25% of Americans dislike both of the major party candidates. If the libertarians can't grasp a decent chunk of that 25%, I don't know what we're doing here. I agree. And I think, you know, it starts with us running a really positive campaign, a campaign that's very markedly different in terms of tone and tenor than what you're going to get from Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Donald Trump will spend the next five months relentlessly attacking Joe Biden and his record. And Joe Biden will spend the next five months relentlessly attacking Donald Trump and his record and his statements. Instead of me attacking both of them, I think it's a better use of my time to travel around the country to speak to a different message, a positive message that could turn people on. They are dying to vote for somebody for somebody that is not Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And so we can't merely be a protest vote. We have to be somebody who's speaking a very different tone that breaks through the static because when the monkeys at the zoo are throwing poo at each other, that is the equivalent (laughs) of the political discourse we have from the two major parties. 
And I think if we want to break through, we have to do that being positive and just saying, hey, I'm ready to listen to you and engage with you. Right. I had really good success speaking with voters across the country, and hopefully we'll see that at the ballot box this November. Chase, another thing that I think is troublesome is that it doesn't seem to be the case that the Libertarians are going to get on all 50 ballots this year. Can you speak to that a little bit? It certainly looks like right now we're at about 49 being the best because New York has just told us that we will not be on the ballot because we did not gain enough signatures. I will still be a certified writing candidate in New York, so New Yorkers can still vote for the Libertarian. Uh, it's just not going to be a name on the ballot. Luckily, Chase Oliver is a pretty easy name to spell. But there have been challenges across the country in getting on the ballot. We still have ballot access drives that are open in states all over the country. Pennsylvania and Kentucky are the two that I'm going to be touching base with next, I believe. And so I'm hoping we can be on the ballot in as many states as possible. But yeah, ballot access has always been a challenge, not just internally, but externally with the way the government tries to throw hurdles in your way to get on the ballot. In fact, Tennessee is a great example. So in Tennessee, we need 250 signatures, but need like 20,000 signatures to run as a libertarian. So even though my name will be on the ballot, there'll be an I next to my name, not an L, because they've gamed the system. You only need that 250 signatures, by the way, to run as a Republican or a Democrat. It's only anything outside the two-party system or an independent, so that the two-party system is trying to make it harder and harder for libertarians to reach the ballot line. And this is one of the reasons why I encourage people to step outside of it, because once we hit certain percentages, it makes it impossible for them to deny us that spot on the ballot. And why hasn't there been a court challenge to that? Well, the court challenge to Tennessee, there have been in the past, I believe. The Libertarian Party has been quite litigious on ballot access in the past. I know from here in my home state of Georgia, we had Cowan v. Raffensperger, where we sued the Secretary of State because we had a write-in candidate saying it was too hard to get on the ballot because in Georgia, to run for Congress, you need 5% of the registered voters in the district, which is like 30,000 voters. That's a huge threshold for a congressional district. We took them to court. They shut us down from 5% to 1%. And when that happened, lo and behold, every congressional district had a libertarian that wanted to run. We're continuing to try to challenge in courtrooms across this country. If I could raise the muster to sue New York for how terrible they are, I would love to because they're the worst in the country. They give you six weeks to collect 45,000 signatures. It's a huge hassle. I would love to continue court challenging at the judicial level for ballot access. And I would love if others would continue to do that as well. Let's switch, if we can, to a topic that's going to annoy your young voters and that's college loans. I presume from what I've read that you are against student loan forgiveness? Yeah, so I actually am against just outright forgiving the loan. If I could wave the magic wand, the, the legislation I would pass would say no new government-backed student loans, which 90% of the student loans right now are backed by the federal government. This increases artificially the cost of higher education. In exchange for no new government loans, government-backed loans, interest-free as of today, so that way people could pay down the principal, they don't get stuck in the interest cycle loop. And we would pay for that by targeted cuts to the government. We would lose revenue from that lost interest. But I think it's worth it to get people out from under this debt crisis and start letting them spend their money in the economy as opposed to spending money to pay down government-backed loans many times that really weren't worth what they were you know, being charged for. So I think we need to untie the government's influence in higher education. And I think this is a great way to do it while providing some of those who are currently paying down their loans, pay down the principal, don't have to worry about interest and bringing market practices back to higher education. That, I think, is a much better package than just loan forgiveness, which we'll have to redo again in 15 or 20 years if we continue the status quo cycle. One of the things that James and I have, I think when we first proposed it, it was kind of tongue-in-cheek, and then the more we thought about it, the more we thought, no, this is the right answer that solves the loan problem as well as focuses colleges on providing value, and that is require colleges to loan directly out of their endowments. And all of a sudden, they would become laser focused on producing students with high market value. Yeah, you know, it's amazing what happens when you bring market practices into <laughs> right. things that haven't had it for a long period of time. You all of a sudden start to see competition, efficiency, uh, and that's what we really need across the board with higher education. We're continuing to see tuitions rise and the value you get out of that tuition in the long run is not rising to keep pace. And that is a real concern. For so many people who want to go to college, they want to get a degree, they want to enter into a, a field that requires that higher education, but they're just not seeing the return on that investment anymore. And that's turning off a lot of people uh, away from really good industries and really good jobs that we need to have filled. And then it's also important to remember that millions and millions of young people never go to college. What we would be doing is we would be forgiving the debt that these people who went to four-year college accrued on the backs of people who just went right into the workforce, who became you know plumbers. And you know, like me, I got started in the restaurant industry. I was a dishwasher was my first job. I don't think dishwashers should have to pay for the college tuitions of people who became attorneys and doctors and teachers and, and uh, a lot of other degree-required 
industries. So for me, that's another reason why I'm just against the loan forgiveness altogether is because it's not fair to those who never sought higher education. Would you shut down the Department of Education? Yes. If I could wave a magic wand, I would. I would return and block grant that money back to states who could block grant it back to localities. Ideally, I would like to localize education as much as possible. <laughs> education is funded via taxation right now. And if it's going to continue, I would like to see that happening at the local level where we're funding students and not systems, allowing parents to find the best education for their kids. If you live in a place with great public education, you're probably going to keep funding that because they already have the building, logistics, the bus routes, everything. But if you live in, like, say, Atlanta, where the Atlanta city schools were so bad that teachers were cheating and got caught under RICO statutes, you know, to cheat on tests to get more funding, parents there might want more options for their kids. And I think this is a great way to really bring marketplace practices into education and bring more uh, opportunity and better diversity of education. Chase, for years, the Supreme Court was the only branch of government that was looked upon favorably by the American people. That's clearly over. Now we don't respect any of the three branches of government. So is there anything you could say or do to regain the trust of the American people with the judicial branch? Crazily enough, and this is going to sound kind of contradictory when I say both of these things, I think we need to stop politicizing the Supreme Court. And I think one of the ways we do that, term limits for the Supreme Court of 18 years. So that way, every two years, we get a new Supreme Court justice. This just basically lets everybody know that whomever the president is, is going to get two. I think that is one way to actually restore trust in the court is to not have these lifetime appointments to continue to have fresh ideas and fresh blood being introduced into the court. And I think part of it is we stop insisting that the court do the job of the legislature. This is another reason why the executive branch is so not trusted is because they continue to govern via executive order. And right now we're having, you know, um, our judicial branch basically governing via the judicial decision and kind of legislating from the bench. And that's something that I think has been a problem for a long time. But I think that has more to do with the fact that our legislature just completely abandons their responsibility to actually legislate from the Congress. Major judicial reforms, I think in terms of like the criminal justice code, getting rid of mandatory minimums that tie the hands of judges that forbid them from treating things on a case by case basis, uh, ending the death penalty in this country. Lord knows one of the reasons why I distrust our criminal justice system and our courts is because we put too many innocent people to death. And so I think there are steps from the criminal side of the judicial system that we can actually uh, put in place to restore trust in our judges and our court systems as well, not just the Supreme Court, but individual criminal cases. Of course, the answer you gave would require a constitutional amendment. Uh, Which is near impossible. Yeah, okay. As long as we all agree that that's almost impossible. We can hey, I recognize the threshold of getting anything changed via the constitutional process. While we're on the subject, if I could just say really quickly, if I could wave a magic wand and put an amendment to the Constitution, that would not be the first one. It would be, I would like to eliminate the language of the 13th Amendment that allows for government-sanctioned slavery. I think that's the most important thing that we need to change in our Constitution is the fact that they have allowed that loophole. God willing, if there was ever a thing we could get enough people around and enough state legislatures around to supporting, I think that would be a great one. But Could you talk a little bit more about that? James knows what the 13th Amendment is. I don't. Let me ask a more pointed question then. Do you think for some reason, Chase, that prisoners shouldn't be either A, able to, or B, required to work as part of their sentence? I think they should be compensated for the work that they do. I think that being forced to work is not what reparative justice is about necessarily, especially when you're working for pennies on the dollar. I think if you just look at the Louisiana governor's mansion, the fact that they have prison labor who are vacuuming the floors and sling the toilets to me, does not speak to a justice system that's really about rehabilitation and repairing people's lives and getting them back into society. It's about punishing people. And I don't think punishment is where we need to be putting our criminal justice priorities. Certainly, there are some people who you need to completely separate from society forever. There, that's why life in prison is a term that exists. We have a prison system that actually is a trauma factory. We traumatize people via punishment, and we release them back out into the world, and they they... For many times, they go right back into what brought them into prison in the first place because it's their natural reaction to trauma is to go back to what made them comfortable. And that's usually right. the life that they had ahead of time. Let's live in the real world. Prisons are big institutions. They need all kinds of things to run. Let's just say we're all going to talk about the laundry, the prison laundry. Do you suggest that we have to hire people at market wages to come in and do the laundry of prisoners? That it's somehow unjust to tell a prisoner, hey, man, go do the laundry. There has to be some level of compensation. Now, you could argue that, hey, we're paying you the market rate, and now we're deducting your room and board, so to speak, for the cost of you being here. But there needs to be some sort of compensation. I know people who have worked 
for pennies on the dollar in terms of what their value is in prisons. And then they're paying three times the market rate to get a Coke out of the vending machine. I understand all of that, but you're left with a very uncomfortable position, right? You're, on the one hand, you're saying, we as a society choose to lock you up and take away your freedom, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But once we do that, we have to pay you minimum wage for anything we tell you you have to do. Yeah, well, sounds crazy as a libertarian, but you know, prison is a cost to society. It's something that should cost us, especially if it's the flip side is slave labor. I just don't believe in that. Uh, I believe that we do have to pay for the cost of imprisoning people. But of course, you know, in a libertarian society, we would do away with victimless crimes. We'd have far less people in prison beds. We'd have far less of a cost to society for what prisons are putting onto us right now. I know it's uncomfortable, but yeah, I do believe that you would have to pay people for the work that they do because there's a dignity in that. And that if you rob people of that dignity, you're basically telling that they are worth less. That creates its own certain kind of trauma. I don't like that cycle. And I think one of the ways we break it is by treating people with human dignity and paying them for the work that they've done. I am so heartened listening to you. Way too often, libertarians give crackpot answers. You're demonstrating for me one of the things that James and I have talked a lot about that was lacking in the Libertarian Party is the ability to balance principle with reality. I think it's something that we have to be better about doing. You know, the old saying is that you campaign in poetry and you govern in prose, but we have to be willing to answer the questions. I appreciate that we haven't gotten a single platitude yet. Very much I'm so. trying. I'm trying <laughs> my best. <laughs> Chase, are you planning on participating in any of the third party debates? Yeah. So I'm actually going to be participating in the free and equal debate. That'll be happening at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas. Uh, it'll be co-moderated by Christina Tubin and Congressman Thomas Massey. Myself and Jill Stein of the Green Party and Randall Terry of the Constitution Party have already agreed to appear. Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Robert Kennedy and Cornell West are all invited. I don't know if they're going to show up or not, but I'm going to be there in Las Vegas. And I think we have to utilize every opportunity we can. I'm also doing a debate this coming week on immigration with a group called Zero Hedge, where myself and one of the editors of Reason Magazine are debating the pro-immigration side against two kind of right-wing Trump supporters who are very anti-immigration. And then I'll be participating in the Soho debate series. I will be arguing at the Soho Forum. In the negative, I will be debating against Art Laffer, the creator of the Laffer Curve, the Reagan-era economist. And the question, which I will be arguing the negative, Donald Trump is the greatest choice for president in the year of 2024. So I think this will be a great opportunity for me to contrast my beliefs with that of Donald Trump as a campaign, reutilizing every opportunity to get in front of a microphone that we can, that we feel will benefit the campaign. And uh, seeing as how you haven't shrunken away from the idea of constitutional amendment, do you think we should have one for an upper age limit on the presidency? We have a constitutional specification for the lower age limit. What about an upper age limit? A shout out to our friends north of the border in Canada. They actually have an age limit of 75 years for their Senate and their Supreme Court. You know, maybe that's an idea that needs to roam southward and one of the executive branch as well. I think 75 would be a pretty fair cutoff that would have us picking a different Republican and Democrat this election, which I think would satisfy a majority of the American voters. So maybe that's an idea whose time will come when we get the ability to pass another constitutional amendment. Well, that's all the questions we've got for you, Chase. But what the hell? You're a politician. Would you like to say anything? I'll give you my quick elevator pitch and where to find me. My elevator pitch is this. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're living your life in peace without force, fraud, coercion, theft, or violence, I believe your life is your life, your body is your body, your business is your business, and your property is your property, so long as you're living in peace and not harming anyone. I appreciate the chance that you guys have given me to speak. I always appreciate having a conversation with y'all. It's never just platitudes, as you said. It gets a little more in-depth, and I would love to speak to y'all again in the future. But for those who are listening, you can find me at votechaseoliver.com. We have a great website. If you're a podcast host out there who's going to have me in front of a microphone, I urge you to go there and check that out. And uh, I urge people to support us at Chase for Liberty on all the social media platforms. Keep an eye out with what we're doing. Thank you guys for uh, jumping on here. And thank you again for there at the beginning of the journey at the South Carolina Convention. And we hope to see you guys, you know, as a campaign again in the future. Thank you, Chase. Best of luck. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Try to be nice to one person who doesn't deserve it. Till next week, can't take it easy. See you next week, James.